or haven't quite gotten this toss off the boat completely. And now it's time for the sermon. Now I want you to know that I'm having greater than ever expectations at First Christian Church. We had two more flock meetings over the weekend. We have one left. If you haven't been to a flock meeting, next Saturday, 10 o'clock, here. Down around the corner, through the woods, in the back room back there. If you haven't been, you need to come because we're having a good time and you don't want to be left out. Now, repeat with me. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Next week we're going to have a guest. I forgot that part. We're going to have two guests next week. The first is Larry Ross, our, our associate regional minister. Or, that's not what you're called here, is it? He's the, he's the area minister for the North Texas area of the churches. He's coming, and we, ha we had conversation about uh, what he wanted to do when he was installing me. And, and he, he says, well, you will preach, won't you? I took that as a hint that he wanted to hear me preach, and I said, okay. So he's going to do installation. He's going to help us with communion. He's going to be our guest. The other guest we're going to have is my wife. Sheila will be here next, next Sunday. So she'll be the strange woman you see me hug and kiss. Boy, I hope that's who I hug and kiss. I just had that thought. Becoming great begins with our expectations. Repeat after me. How we do anything is how we do everything. All right. For five weeks we've been talking about, we get one more week after today, talking about great expectations and, and great churches. I want you to remember all of the things that I've been teaching you for the last five weeks because I want Larry Ross to be really impressed. <laughs> Okay. How many of you can remember some of what I've taught for the next oh, week? Of course you can. I'll be able to give this sermon on January 14th, two years from now. And do you know that most of you will remember all five of the things that it takes to make a great church? The statistics prove me right on that. You are learning and you are fabulous. I want you to know that. Turn to a neighbor and say, you're fabulous. Fabulous. All right. Well, let's practice. Hands up. The five things that great churches do. They. They do. They do. They do. And they do. All right. Turn to a neighbor and say, you got it right. All right. You know, we've been talking about this long enough. Most of you could give this sermon. I don't know if you've noticed, but over and over, we've been getting the same sermon in different stories. And that's part of the good news. You know, Jesus only ever told one story. He just used different characters in different settings. I learned from the Master. You know, worship is our basic act as God's people. Ministry is what we do because of God's presence. Evangelism is the first step towards meeting people's needs. And fellowship is the second step. We talked about last week, faith-filled fellowship. Let's practice that. Great churches, repeat after me, sorry, great churches, great churches. have faith-filled fellowship. Now, faith-filled fellowship leads us to the final of the five things that great churches do, and that is discipleship. But last week, we actually identified how to build, I don't know if you remember or not, identified for us how to build faith-filled fellowships, and I told you it was the acronym TIME. Trust requiring intentional moments and efforts. Do you all remember that? See, I didn't make you say that three times last week, and so you don't remember. Repeat after me. Trust requires, Trust requires 
intentional moments, intentional moments. And, efforts. and efforts. All right. That is, by the way, a tricky way for your pastor to set up today's sermon because I just, I just defined deliberate discipleship. So you are started to think about it last week, and I fed you into this week. Great churches do deliberate discipleship. Repeat after me. Great churches, Great churches. Do, deliberate discipleship. do deliberate discipleship. Now I want to call your attention back to the Gospel of Matthew that we've been reading for the last month. Back to chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, which reads like this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now I know some of you have already made, memorized Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. If you need a new thing to work on memorizing, try Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Now next week there's a test, just so you know. Of course, it's open book. I only ever give tests that we can pass. How many is glad about that? So what is deliberate discipleship? Well, deliberate discipleship, simply put, is intentionally learning to follow Jesus Christ. The children helped us this morning learn that. Give them a round of applause because they didn't know they were preaching. Now, I was reminded of an old saying that I heard in an old sermon when I was in seminary in a class called The Black Religious Experience in America. Do you know what we did in that class? We went to church in African-American congregations. Only back then we called them black congregations. I think that's because, no, we don't know that. We hadn't learned about, you know, all of the right political words yet. But went to this one church, and it had about a 1,000 people in it. And the sermon went on and on and on. If you think I'm long-winded, let me tell you about this sermon. He only had one phrase in the whole sermon, or it seemed like it. And it went like this, and you're going to get to be a part of that sermon 30 years ago. Ready? He would do this over here, and he would say, Disciples see. Oh, thank you, John. Okay, so let's practice it. Ready? When I point to this side, you're going to say, Disciples see. Ready? Disciples see. And then he would point to this side of the room and he, they would say, disciples do. Disciples do. Okay, so ready? Disciples see. Disciples do. Disciples see. Disciples do. Okay. Now that went on. We were there in the sermon for 45 minutes. And he would do this. And this. And then he would say, and disciples see what Jesus did. And then he would give long lists. And, and then he would point over here and they would say, disciples do. And then he would make long lists of what the disciples did. And it went on and on and on. I thought it was one of the greatest sermons I ever heard. I can guarantee you that his people did not leave worship not knowing what disciples did we're supposed to do. So, let's talk about that. Deliberate discipleship is about we have to see as disciples. What do we have to see? We have to see, ready kids? Jesus. Okay, you all need, next week when I do this for Larry, I want to hear Jesus, okay? Maybe like the Texas Longhorns needed to say it yesterday after the football game. <laughs> you got that, right? Okay, so disciples see. What did disciples see? Disciples saw what Jesus did over and over and over and over and over again. And what did they see Jesus do? 
They saw Jesus do acts of mercy, healing, bringing hope, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, restoring integrity and empathy to the people. And the list is longer. Jesus kept doing things and doing things and doing things. And what did disciples do? They learned to do the same thing. They learned to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give water to the thirsty, to heal the brokenhearted, to heal those who are sick, to cast out the demons of people's lives, just like Jesus did. And if we're going to be a great church or a greater church, we have got to learn to be greater disciples. And that means we need to... And Okay, let's just shorten it now because they were smart over here. When I point to this side, just skip the disciples part and say C. And two. There we go. Way to go, choir. You know, the choir's kind of divided too, kind of like the sanctuary. All right, so what else did they see Jesus do? They saw Jesus worship and they saw Jesus read scripture and they saw Jesus do all kinds of different things. And then they were expected to do the same thing. Now what I'm going to tell you is that discipleship has to be deliberate. Discipleship doesn't just happen. In fact, if you wait for discipleship to happen, you're going to have a very, very long wait. Now I have special guests here today who are going to help us understand about see and do. So Glenn and Jen, would you come up here? They're not really guests. They're always here. Both services. Now, this is really cool. You know that they are trained in martial arts, and Glenn's working on his black belt, and Jen's working on her brown belt. And you notice I'm standing way over here out of the way. Um, actually, I feel really safe whenever they're up here on the podium with me. I feel really safe. Now, how long have you been doing um, Take One Take One Go? Two years. Two years, and Glenn? More than 30. So that means you're better than Jen a little bit. He's a, higher rank. He's a higher rank as well. Now, obviously, you can tell what's about to happen. Glenn's going to hold this board, and Jen's going to break it. Right? Okay. It worked perfectly in the first service. I have, I have no issue. Now, when you started doing this, could you do what you were about to do? Why not? You needed to be trained. And who trained you? People of higher rank. And they're... Ah, so there is somebody at the top of the list. His name is Grandmaster Cho. Cho, sorry. Um, in, my, in the little bit of training I've done, they have senseis or teachers. I want you to watch what happens here. All right. Give her a nice job. All right. Who's next? No takers? You want me to do it? Okay, next week. <laughs> How fast can I do the training? <laughs> 30 years. It might take me that long. That's right. Okay. What you just saw was discipleship at work. They just don't call it that. You see, as Christians, as members of the faith, we are called to live a faithful life. And the only way to do that is to practice it. I tell people that discipleship is the working out part of the Christian faith. Now, how many of you ran a marathon this week? How many of you um, walked down the stairs from your bedroom this week? No. That's me. I have friends that run marathons. I, 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 want, I can tell you about my friend Pam. Um, she's in incredibly good shape. She runs marathons as a regular thing. 
course, some people think there's something wrong with Pam, but she enjoys it. When she doesn't run, she misses it. And sometimes she rides her bike to work. It's 47 miles. The amazing thing is oftentimes she can ride her bike to work as fast as she can drive because traffic in Chicago is so bad. Discipleship is about training our faith wives for the future. Training our faith wives to become what God has called us to be. Discipleship is about doing the workout that grows our faith and lifts us up and encourages us for everyday living. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to tell you a secret. I plan on visiting your home soon. By June 30th of next year, I plan to be in every home in the church. Now, some of you need to start cleaning now. I get it. I'm even going to tell you what to clean. I'm going to come into homes. I come into homes all the time. And I get really excited. There will be a Bible sitting on the table. And I have to tell you, I have kind of an odd sense of humor. If there's a Bible on the table, it's very likely I will come over and do this. And then I'll look at my fingertips. And then I've been known, you know, like on the back of some of those cars you've seen that say, wash me, I'll sometimes say, Open me. We can't be disciples of Jesus Christ if we don't know what Jesus wants us to do. It's that simple. And the only way to really know what Jesus wants us to do, well, there are several ways, but the single best way to know what Jesus wants us to do is to have one of these wonderful, cool little books. And if you don't have one, see me. I'll make sure you get one. And I particularly like the ones that, that help me know when Jesus is talking and you can help me and tell me what color is on that page. Red. So you have one of these that has red words in it. Here's the clue. If it's in red and it tells you to do something, it's not an option. Well, it's always an option, but not if you want to be faithful. Now, I'm going to tell you that we had scripture read today that makes every American and Texan, probably especially, get very nervous. The text from Matthew 19 where Jesus is talking and somebody says, Teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And he says, good teacher. And Jesus says, well, who are you calling good? I always thought that was interesting. But what does the law say? And the guy says, well, which one? And Jesus says, well, don't commit adultery, don't kill anyone, don't do any, and he basically quotes the Ten Commandments, and then he ends it with, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man that he's talking to says, I've done all that. And Jesus says, well, so what else do I need to do? See, the guy knew that keeping the rules wasn't enough. The guy understood that simply following the rules, simply not doing the knots was not enough. So Jesus said, and I quote, well, you only lack one thing, go home, sell everything that you have, Give it away. And of course, in America, that's where we stop. It really is. Because we heard this guy that we say we're following. We've heard this guy that say is Lord of our life and Savior of our souls. This guy that we pledged our allegiance to just pushed us to the very, very edge of our being. Because he says, go sell it all and give it away. 
Now, you all heard Mary read that from right up here. It's in red. So how many in this room today will be going home, boxing it all up and selling it? Whoops. How many of you are just a little uncomfortable that I asked? Go ahead, raise your hands. Now, I've heard lots of preachers make lots of excuses about this text. Jesus didn't really mean it. That's how it usually gets preached. He didn't really mean that you have to give it all away or sell it all. And there's lots of reasons to, for preachers to think that, but it's not what it says. I love that. Now, some of you are laughing, but you probably ought not be laughing so hard. Because how many of you understand that you probably have more stuff than you need? Next time the Thousand Thing Fling Contest comes around, I'll let you know. Duncanville Outreach will be awaiting your gifts. Being a good disciple, developing our discipleship, means doing things on purpose. Do you know... Here was the saddest part about getting rid of those first 1,300 items. Unless I went to my closet, I couldn't tell that I'd gotten rid of 1,300 things. The first 1,300 things didn't make a dent in the stuff, except in my closet. Jesus says, go sell it all, give it away. And the good news is, that's not where the story ends. The story ends with one very, very important, very important command. Go do all this, but then come follow me. Now, good theology says that you really don't need to go home and sell it all. What you really need to do is to make sure when you go home that nothing that you have gets in the way of how you follow Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus needs people with homes. Jesus needs people with stuff to provide for people who don't have stuff, to provide places for church to have Bible studies, to have homes in which to entertain and take care of people. All of that is true. But he says, don't let anything, 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 anything come between you and God. And in fact, if anything comes between you and God, get rid of it. Thank you. My friends, discipleship is about changing who we are into followers of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And the only way to be able to follow Jesus Christ is to know what Jesus Christ wants us to do. And the only way to really know that is to understand the red words in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and in the rest of Scripture. Because if you depend on me to tell you what to do, there will come a time when I'm not here to do that. If you depend on Glenn or anybody else, there will be a time when we're not there to do it. It's truly important for each of us to spend time in God's Word in such a way that our discipleship develops so that we know the answers to the question. We know the answer to the question, what does God want us to do? What does God want me to do? Now here's the good news. I can almost always tell you what God wants you to do. Because Scripture tells me. God wants you to love others, 
to accept them, to forgive them. That's all. But if you do those three things, then life will be good. Because here's the greatest secret of all. The greatest secret of all about Scripture. And I love the fact that the young man says, what do I have to do to be saved? And, he's, and Jesus says, well, what does the law say? And he was able to quote the law. He was able to quote Scripture. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Honor your parents. He knew the Scripture. <coughs> he also knew that it wasn't quite enough. He knew enough to ask one more question. What do I still lack? What's keeping me from being the best follower of Jesus Christ I can be? And isn't that a question that all of us can ask? How many of you can ask that question? <coughs> What's keeping me from being the best disciple I can be? Because even if you're a great disciple, there's one more thing. There's always one more thing. And your Bible will tell you. Now here's the secret. Most people think of the church and the Bible as a rule book about things you can't do. You know, don't do this, don't do that. How many of you have heard the thou shalt nots? I'm going to tell you something. If we all <coughs> together spend our time doing what this book tells us to do, you'll never have to worry about doing what it tells you not to do. Ever. So we have to do the do. Disciples see and disciples do. Mm -hmm. Our faith is no different. This is another one of those places that things are changing just a little bit. You all filled out a card and you put your name on it. And you didn't know what to do with it, so you just kept it. This is where you're going to need this card. Because in November, we're going to have a Bible study. Actually, probably two. It's going to be the same study both times, one during the day, one at night. But I need some help. I need you to put on this card when you would like this Bible study to be. So if you want it Sunday at 11, it isn't happening. But any other time we can negotiate. And whatever are the two best times, we're going to have Bible study. The theme of the Bible study is grace, God's greatest gift to you. It's going to be four sessions long during the month of November. That's all. But I need to know when to plan it and schedule it. Now on your way out, you're going to hand that card either to me or to Glenn at the back door. That way we'll know. If you need to invite Jesus into your life, we invite you to do that today. If you need to make First Christian Church your church home by transferring your membership, having already been baptized, we invite you to do that today as well. As we do, do either of those things by coming forward as we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation, number 16.